Meetings with Remarkable Men, Chapter 10 Professor Skridloff From the early years of my responsible life, another essence friend of mine, many years older than I, was Skridloff, professor of archaeology, who disappeared leaving no trace at the time of the great agitation of mines in Russia. I first met Professor Skridloff, as I have written in the chapter on Prince Yuri Lubavetsky, when he engaged me as his guide for the environs of Cairo. Soon after this, I met him again in ancient Thebes, where I ended my first trip with Prince Yuri Lubavetsky, and where the professor joined us to make some excavations. We lived there together for three weeks in one of the tombs, and during pauses in our work talked on all kinds of abstract themes. And in spite of the difference in our ages, we gradually became such intimate and good friends that when Prince Yuri left for Russia, we did not part, but decided to undertake a long journey together. From Thebes we traveled up the Nile to its source, and went on into Abyssinia, where we stayed about three months, and then, coming out to the Red Sea, we passed through Syria and finally reached the ruins of Babylon. We were there together for four months, after which Professor Skridloff stayed behind to continue his excavations, and I went off through Meshed to Ispahan in the company of two Persians, traders in rugs, whom I chanced to meet in a little village near Babylon, and with whom... I became great friends owing to our common interest in antique rugs. I next met Professor Skridloff two years later when he arrived with Prince Lubavetsky in the town of Orenburg, which was to be the starting point of our big expedition across Siberia for a certain purpose connected with the program drawn up by that same group of seekers of truth, which I have already mentioned several times. After the Siberian trip, we often met again for long and short journeys through various remote places, chiefly in Asia and Africa, as well as for brief exchanges of personal opinions when necessary. And we also met by chance. I will describe in as much detail as possible one meeting of ours and the ensuing long journey together, during which Professor Skridloff reached a turning point in his general inner psyche in the sense that, from then on, it began to be activated not only by his thoughts, but also by his feelings and his instinct. These latter even began to predominate, or, as is said, to take the initiative. On this occasion I met him quite by chance in Russia, very soon after the meeting I had had with Prince Lubavetsky in Constantinople. I was on my way to Transcaucasia, and in the buffet of one of the railway stations I was hurrying to finish one of the famous beef cutlets made of horse flesh, which the Kazanian Tartars supply to the Russian railway buffets, when all of a sudden someone standing behind me put his arm round me. I turned round and saw my old friend Skridloff. It turned out that he was going on the same train as I to see his daughter, who was then living at the health resort in Piatigorsk. The meeting was a happy one for both of us. We decided to sit together for the rest of the journey, and the professor gladly changed from second class to third, in which, of course, I was traveling. We talked all the way. He told me how, after leaving the ruins of Babylon, he had returned to Thebes and had made some further excavations in the environs. During these two years, he had made numerous interesting and valuable discoveries, but finally, becoming very homesick for Russia and his children, he had decided to take a vacation. On his return to Russia, he had gone straight to St. Petersburg, and then to Yaroslavl, to see his elder daughter, and he was now on his way to see the younger, who during his absence had prepared two grandchildren for him. How long he would stay in Russia and what he would do next, he did not yet know. In my turn, I told him how I had spent these last two years, how, soon after we had parted, I had become very interested in Islam, 
and after having great difficulties and by much cunning had managed to get into Mecca and Medina, inaccessible to Christians. In the hope of penetrating into the secret heart of this religion, and of perhaps finding answers there to certain questions I had considered essential. But my labors had been in vain, I found nothing. I only made clear to myself that if there was anything in this religion it must be sought not there, as everyone says and believes, but in Bukhara, where from the beginning the secret knowledge of Islam has been concentrated, this place having become its very center and source. And as I had not lost either interest or hope, I had decided to go to Bukhara with a group of Sarts who, having come to Mecca and Medina as pilgrims, were returning home and with whom I had intentionally established friendly relations. I further told him of the circumstances which had then prevented me from going straight to Bukhara, namely that on arriving in Constantinople I had met Prince Lubavetsky, who had asked me to escort a certain person to his sister in the Tambov province, from which I was just returning and I was now thinking of going for the time being to Transcaucasia to see my family, and of then retracing my steps in the direction of Bukhara and going there. With your old friend Skridloff, he said, finishing my sentence. He then told me that often during the last three years he had dreamed of going to Bukhara and to the Samarkand region nearby for the purpose of verifying certain data connected with Tamerlane, which he needed in order to elucidate an archaeological question that greatly interested him. Only very recently he had again been thinking about this, but had hesitated to undertake the journey alone, and now, hearing that I was going there, he would gladly join me if I had no objection. Two months later, as we had agreed, we met in Tiflis, and went from there to Transcaspian region intending to go to Bukhara. But on reaching the ruins of old Merv, we stayed there for about a year. First of all, to explain why this happened, it must be said that long before our decision to go to Bukhara together, the professor and I had had many talks and made many plans for somehow getting into Kafiristan the very country which it was then quite impossible for a European to enter at will. We wished to go there chiefly because, according to all the information we obtained from conversations with various people, we had come to the conclusion that in that country we might find answers to a great many questions which interested us, both psychological and archaeological. In Tiflis, we had begun to supply ourselves with everything necessary for our journey to Bukhara, including letters of introduction, and we happened to meet and have conversations with various people who knew those regions. As a result of these conversations and our own discussions afterwards, our desire to enter Kafiristan, inaccessible as it was to Europeans, became so intense that we decided to do everything possible to go there immediately after Bukhara. All our previous interests seemed to disappear, and the whole way to Turkestan we thought and talked only about what measures we would have to take to carry out this daring project of ours. But a definite plan for getting into Kafiristan happened to take shape in the following circumstances. When our train stopped at the station of New Merv, on the Central Asiatic Railway, I went to the buffet to get some hot water for tea, and as I was returning to our carriage, I was suddenly embraced by a man in Tekinian clothes. This man turned out to be my good old Greek friend, Vasiliaki, a tailor by profession who had been living in the town of Merv for a long time. On hearing that I was passing through on my way to Bukhara, he implored me to wait until the next day's train and come to the big family festivities which were to take place that very evening on the occasion of the christening of his first child. His request was so sincere and touching that I could not flatly refuse him, and I asked him to wait a moment. 
certain that there was very little time left before the departure of the train. I ran off at full speed, spilling hot water all around me to consult the professor. While I was squeezing my way with difficulty through the crowd of passengers getting in and out of the carriage, the professor, seeing me coming, waved his hand and shouted, I'm already collecting our things. Go back quickly and take them through the window. He had evidently seen my chance meeting and had guessed the suggestion that had been made to me. When I went back, no less hurriedly, to the platform and began to take the things he handed me through the window, it turned out that our haste was quite unnecessary, as the train was to stay there for more than two hours, waiting for a connection from the Kushka branch, which was laid. At supper that evening, after the religious ceremony of the christening, there sat next to me an old Turkoman nomad, a friend of the host and owner of a large flock of Karakul sheep. In the course of my conversation with him about the life of nomads in general and about the different tribes of Central Asia, we began talking about the various independent tribes inhabiting the region of Kafiristan. Continuing our conversation after supper, during which, of course, Russian vodka had not been economized, the old man, by the way, and as though to himself, expressed an opinion which Professor Skridloff and I took as advice. And in accordance with it, we drew up a definite plan for carrying out our intention. He said that, notwithstanding the almost organic distaste of the inhabitants of this region for having anything to do with people not belonging to their own tribes, there was nevertheless developed in nearly every one of them, to whatever tribe he belonged, a certain something which naturally arouses in him a feeling of respect and even love towards all persons, whatever their race, who devote themselves to the service of God. After this thought had been expressed by a nomad whom we had met by chance, and who had spoken perhaps thanks only to Russian vodka, all our deliberations that night and the next day were based on the idea that we might get into this country, not as ordinary mortals, but by assuming the appearance of persons who are shown special respect there, and who have the possibility of going freely everywhere without arousing suspicion. The following evening, still in the midst of our deliberations, we were sitting in one of the Tekinian Chaikanas of New Merv, where two parties of Turkoman libertines were indulging in kaif with bachi, that is, with boy dancers whose chief occupation authorized by local laws, and also encouraged by the laws of the great empire of Russia, which then had a protectorate over this country, is the same as that carried on in Europe, also legally, by women with yellow tickets. And here in this atmosphere we categorically decided that Professor Skridloff should disguise himself as a venerable Persian dervish, and I should pass for a direct descendant of Mohammed, that is to say, for a Seyyid. To prepare ourselves for this masquerade, a long time was necessary as well as a quiet, isolated spot. And that is why we decided to settle down in the ruins of old Merv, which met these requirements, and where, moreover, we could at times, for a rest, make some excavations. Our preparation consisted in learning a great many sacred Persian chants and instructive sayings of former times, as well as in letting our hair grow long enough for us to look like the people for whom we intended to pass. Makeup, in this case, was quite out of the question. After we had lived in this way for about a year, and were finally satisfied both with our appearance and our knowledge of religious verses and psalms, one day, very early in the morning, we left the ruins of old Merv, which had come to be like home for us, and going on foot as far as the station of Bairam Ali on the Central Asiatic Railway, we took a train to Chardzu, and from there set off by boat 
up the river Amudarya. It was on the banks of this river Amudarya in ancient times called the Oxus and deified by certain peoples of Central Asia that the germ of contemporary culture first appeared on earth. And during my journey up this river with Professor Skridloff, an incident occurred. Extraordinary for Europeans, but very characteristic of the local patriarchal morality, as yet unaffected by contemporary civilization. The victim of which was an exceedingly good old sart. The memory of this incident has often evoked in me the feeling of remorse of conscience, since it was because of us that this good old man lost his money, perhaps forever. I therefore wish to describe this part of our journey to that country, then inaccessible to Europeans, in as much detail as possible, and to describe it more or less in the style of a literary school, which I happened to study in my youth, and which arose and flourished, so it seems, just here on the shores of this great river. A style called The Creation of Images Without Words. The Amudarya, which higher up in its course is called the river Pianzi, has its main sources in the Hindu Kush mountains and flows at the present time into the Aral Sea, though formerly, according to certain historical data, it emptied into the Caspian Sea. At the period to which the present story relates, this river washed the boundaries of many countries the former Russia, the Kivan Khanate, the Bukharian Khanate, Afghanistan, Kafiristan, British India, and so on. It was formerly navigated by rafts of a special kind, but when the region was conquered by Russia, a river fleet of flat-bottomed steamboats was launched, which, besides fulfilling certain military needs, provided passenger and cargo service between the Aral Sea and the upper reaches of the river. And so I begin, also of course for the purpose of resting, to wiseacre a little in the style of the aforementioned ancient literary school. Amudarya, clear early morning. The mountain peaks are gilded by the rays of the still hidden sun. Gradually the nocturnal silence and the monotonous murmur of the river give place to the cries of awakened birds and animals, to the voices of people, and to the clatter of the steamboat's wheels. On both banks the fires which had burned out during the night are being rekindled. Spirals begin to rise from the funnel of the boat's kitchen, mingling with the suffocating smoke of damp soxol spreading everywhere. Overnight the banks have noticeably changed in appearance, although the boat has not moved. It is the ninth day since it left Chardzu for Kirki, although on the first two days the boat moved forward very slowly. It was not held up, but on the third day it ran aground and stopped for a whole day and night until the Amudaria, by the force of its current, washed away the sandbank and made it possible to move on. Thirty-six hours later, the same thing occurred, and now it is already the third day that the steamer has been stationary, unable to move further. The passengers and crew are patiently waiting until this wayward river takes pity and lets them proceed. Here, this is quite usual. The river Amudarya runs through sands for almost its entire course. Having a very strong current and an irregular volume of water, it is always either washing away its unstable banks or depositing sand on them. And its bed is thus constantly changing, with sandbanks forming where before there were whirlpool depths. Boats going upstream go very slowly, particularly at certain seasons of the year but downstream they fly like mad almost without the engine. One can never determine beforehand, even approximately, the time it will take to travel from one point to another. Knowing this, P. 
people who travel upstream provide themselves for any emergency with enough food for several months. The time of year in which this journey of ours up the Amu Darya takes place is the least favorable, owing to the low water. Winter is approaching. The rainy season is over. And in the mountains, where the river chiefly takes its source, the thawing of snow has ceased. Travel is also not particularly agreeable, because just at this season the cargo and passenger traffic on these boats is at its height. The cotton has been picked everywhere. The fruit and vegetables of the fertile oases have been gathered and dried. The caracol sheep have been sorted, and the inhabitants of the regions through which the Amu Darya flows are all traveling on it. Some are returning to their villages, Others are taking their cheeses to market to exchange them for articles needed for the short winter. Still others are going on pilgrimages or to their relatives. That is why, when we came on board, the boat was so crammed with passengers. Among them are Bukharians, Kivans, Tekis, Persians, Afghans, and representatives of many other Asiatic peoples. In this picturesque and motley crowd... Merchants predominate. Some are transporting goods, others going upstream for supplies of cheese. Here is a Persian, a merchant of dried fruits. Here an Armenian going to buy Kirky's rugs on the spot. And a Polish agent, a cotton buyer from the firm of Poznanski. Here a Russian Jew, a buyer of caracal skins and a Lithuanian commercial traveler with samples of picture frames in paper mache and all kinds of ornaments of gilt metal set with artificial colored stones. Many officials and officers of the frontier guard and fusiliers and sappers of the Transcaspian regiment are returning from leaves or from their posts. Here is a soldier's wife with a nursing baby going to her husband who has stayed for an extra term of service and has sent for her. Here is a traveling Catholic priest on his official rounds going to confess Catholic soldiers. There are also ladies on board. Here is the wife of a colonel with her lanky daughter returning from Tashkent where she has taken her son, a cadet, to see him off to Orenburg to study in the cadet corps. Here is the wife of a cavalry captain of the frontier guard who has been to Merv to order some dresses at the dressmakers there. And here is a military doctor's wife escorted by his orderly, traveling from Ashkabat to visit her husband, who is serving in solitude because his mother-in-law cannot live without society, which is lacking where he is stationed. Here is a stout woman with an enormous coiffure, undoubtedly of artificial hair, with many rings on her fingers and two enormous brooches on her chest. She is accompanied by two very good-looking girls who call her aunt, but you can see by everything that they are not at all her nieces. Here are also many Russian former and future somebodies, going God knows where and God knows why, also a troupe of traveling musicians with their violins and double basses. From the very first day out of Chardzu, all these people, as it were, sorted themselves out. The so-called intelligentsia, the bourgeoisie, and the peasants formed separate groups, where, making acquaintances among themselves, they soon began to feel as though among old friends. The members of each of these groups began to regard and to act towards the passengers belonging to the other groups, either haughtily or disdainfully or timidly or ingratiatingly, but at the same time they did not hinder one another from arranging things each according to his own wishes and habits. And little by little they became so accustomed to their surroundings that it was as though none of them had ever lived in any other way. Neither the delays in the steamer's progress nor its crowdedness disturbed anyone. On the contrary, they all accommodated themselves so well that the whole journey was like a series of picnics. 
As soon as it became clear that this time the steamer was thoroughly grounded, almost all the passengers gradually went ashore. By the end of the day there appeared on both banks clusters of tents made from whatever came to hand. Smoke arose from many fires, and after an evening gaily spent with music and song, most of the passengers stayed on shore overnight. In the morning, the life of the passengers resumes its rhythm of the day before. Some build fires and make coffee. Others boil water for green tea. Still others go in search of Saksal poles, get ready to go fishing, go out to the steamer and back in small boats, call back and forth between the steamer and shore, or from one bank to the other. And all is done calmly and unhurriedly, as everyone knows that as soon as it is possible to move on, the big bell of the steamer will ring an hour before departure, and there will be plenty of time to return on board. In that part of the boat, where we had settled ourselves, an old sart made his place beside us. It was evident that he was a rich man, because among his things were many bags of money. I do not know how it is now, but at that time, in Bukhara and the neighboring countries, there were no coins of high value. In Bukhara, for instance, the only coin worth anything was called a tianga, an irregularly cut piece of silver equivalent to approximately half a French franc. Any sum larger than fifty francs had therefore to be carried in special bags, which was very inconvenient, especially for travelers. If one had thousands in this coinage, and had to travel with this money, it was necessary to have literally a score of camels or horses to carry it from place to place. On very rare occasions the following method was used. The quantity of Tiangi one wished to transport was given to some Bukharian Jew, who gave in exchange a note to some acquaintance of his, also a Jew, who lived at the place to which one was going. And there the latter, deducting something for his trouble, returned the same amount of Tiangi. And so, on arriving at the town of Kerki, which was as far as the boat went, we left our steamer, changed to a hired kobzir, and continued further. When we were already quite a long way from Kerki, and were making a stop at Termez, where Professor Skridloff had gone ashore with some Sart workmen to get provisions in a nearby village, our kobzir was approached by another one carrying five Sarts, who without saying a word began to unload from their kobzir onto ours twenty-five large sacks filled with tiangi. At first I did not understand what it was all about. Only after the unloading was finished did I gather from the oldest sart that they had been passengers on our steamer, and that when we had disembarked these sacks of tiangi were found in the place which we had occupied. Certain that we had forgotten them, and having learned where we were going, they decided to make haste to catch up with us and give us back the tiangi we had obviously forgotten in the confusion. And he added, I decided to catch up with you without fail, because the same thing happened to me once in my life, and so I understand very well how disagreeable it is to arrive in a strange place without the necessary tiangi. And as for me, it makes no difference if I arrive in my village a week later. I shall regard it as if our steamer had run aground an extra time. I did not know how to reply or what to say to this queer fellow. It was just too unexpected for me, and all I could do was pretend that I understood very little Sart, and wait for the return of the professor. Meanwhile I offered him and his companions some vodka. When I saw Skridloff returning, I quickly went ashore to meet him, as if to help him carry the provisions, and told him all about it. We decided not to refuse the money, but to find out the address of this still unspoiled man, in order to send him a peshkesh in gratitude for his trouble. 
and then to hand over the Tiangi to the nearest Russian frontier post, giving the name of the boat and the date of its last trip, and explaining in as much detail as possible all the facts which could serve to identify our fellow traveler, the Sart who had forgotten these sacks of money on the boat. And so we did. Soon after this incident, which in my opinion could never have occurred among contemporary Europeans, we arrived at the famous town associated with the name of Alexander of Macedonia, which is now nothing more than an ordinary Afghan fort. Here we went ashore, and, assuming the roles thought out beforehand, continued our journey on foot. Passing from one valley to another and coming in contact with many different tribes, we finally came to the central settlement of the Afridis in a region considered to be the heart of Kafiristan. On the way, we did everything required of a dervish and a Said. That is to say, I sang religious verses in Persian, and the professor, after a fashion, beat out corresponding rhythms on the tambourine, in which he then collected alms. I shall not describe the rest of our trip, and the many extraordinary adventures connected with it, but we'll go on to the account of our accidental meeting with a certain man, not far from the aforementioned settlement, a meeting the result of which gave quite another direction to our inner world, and thereby changed all our expectations, intentions, and the plan itself of our future movements. We left the settlement of the Afridis with the intention of proceeding towards Chitral. In the market of the next fairly large place, I was accosted by an old man in native dress, who said to me softly in pure Greek, Please do not be alarmed. I quite accidentally learned that you are Greek. I do not want to know who you are or why you are here. But it would be very pleasant for me to talk with you and see how a fellow countryman breathes. For it is fifty years since I saw a man who was born in the land where I myself was born. By his voice and the expression of his eyes, this old man made such an impression on me that I was immediately filled with perfect trust in him, as in my own father, and I answered him also in Greek. To talk here now is, I think, very awkward. We, at least I, may run great danger. So we must think where we can talk freely without fear of undesirable consequences. Perhaps one of us can think of some way or find some suitable place. And meanwhile I can only say that I myself will be unspeakably glad of this opportunity, for I am utterly weary of having to deal for so many months with people of alien blood. Without replying, he went on his way, and the professor and I went about our business. The next day another man, this time in the habit of a certain monastic order well known in Central Asia, placed in my hand, instead of alms, a note. I read this note when we arrived at the Ashkana, where we had lunch. It was written in Greek and I learned from its contents that the old man of the day before was also one of the, as they were called, self-freed monks of this order, and that we would be allowed to come to their monastery since, regardless of nationality, all men were respected there, who strove towards the one God, creator of all nations and races without distinction. The next day the professor and I went to this monastery where we were received by several monks, among them the same old man. After the customary greeting, he led us to a hill some distance from the monastery, and there we sat down on the steep bank of a small stream and began to eat the food he had brought with him. When we were seated, he said, Here no one will hear or see us and we can talk in perfect quiet about whatever pleases our hearts. In the course of the conversation it turned out that he was an Italian, 
but knew Greek because his mother was a Greek, and in his childhood on her insistence he had spoken this language almost exclusively. He had formerly been a Christian missionary and had lived a long time in India. Once, when he had gone on some missionary work into Afghanistan, he was taken prisoner by Afridi tribesmen while traveling through a certain pass. He was then passed from one to another as a slave, fell into the hands of various groups inhabiting these regions, and finally arrived in this place in the bondage of a certain man. He had succeeded, during his long stay in these isolated countries, in gaining the reputation of being an impartial man who humbly recognized and submitted to all the local conditions of life, established by centuries. And so, through the efforts of this last master of his, to whom he had rendered some important service or other, he was given his full freedom and the promise that he could go whenever he pleased in these countries, as though he were one of the local power-possessing inhabitants. But just at that time he accidentally came in contact with certain adepts of the World Brotherhood, who were striving for what he had dreamed of all his life. And having been admitted to their brotherhood, he did not wish to go anywhere else, but ever since then had lived with them in their monastery. As our trust in this brother, Father Giovanni, which was the name we called him when we learned that he had once been a Catholic priest and had been called Giovanni in his own country, was growing all the time, we considered it necessary to tell him who we really were and why we were disguised. Listening to us with great understanding and clearly wishing to encourage us in our strivings, he thought for a few moments and then, with a kindly, unforgettable smile, said, Very well, then. In the hope that the results of your search will benefit my compatriots also, I will do everything I can to assist you to attain the aim you have set yourselves. The fulfillment of this promise of his began by his obtaining that same day, from the proper source, permission for us to stay at their monastery until we should become clear about our plans and decide what to do next in these regions and how. On the following day we moved into the living quarters of the monastery and first of all took a good rest which we really needed after so many months of tense life. We lived there as we wished, and went everywhere in the monastery freely, except in one building where the chief sheikh lived, and to which were admitted each evening only those adepts who had attained preliminary liberation. With Father Giovanni, we went almost every day to the place where we had sat together the first time we came to the monastery and there had long talks with him. During these talks, Father Giovanni told us a great deal about the inner life of the brethren there, and about the principles of daily existence connected with this inner life. And once, speaking of numerous brotherhoods organized many centuries ago in Asia, he explained to us in a little more detail about this world brotherhood which any man could enter, irrespective of the religion to which he had formerly belonged. As we later ascertained, among the adepts of this monastery there were former Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, Buddhists, Lamists, and even one shamanist. All were united by God the truth. All the brethren of this monastery lived together in such amity that in spite of the specific traits and properties of the representatives of the different religions, Professor Skridloff and I could never tell to which religion this or that brother had formerly belonged. Father Giovanni said much to us also about faith and about the aim of all these various brotherhoods. He spoke so well, so clearly, and so convincingly about truth 
faith and the possibility of transmuting faith in oneself. That once Professor Skridloff, deeply stirred, could not contain himself and exclaimed in astonishment, Father Giovanni, I cannot understand how you can calmly stay here instead of returning to Europe, at least to your own country, Italy, to give the people there, if only a thousandth part of this all-penetrating faith which you are now inspiring in me. Eh, my dear professor, replied Father Giovanni, it is evident that you do not understand man's psyche as well as you understand archaeology. Faith cannot be given to man. Faith arises in a man and increases in its action in him, not as the result of automatic learning, that is, not from any automatic ascertainment of height, breadth, thickness, form, and weight, or from the perception of anything by sight, hearing, touch, smell, or taste, but from understanding. Understanding is the essence obtained from information intentionally learned and from all kinds of experiences personally experienced. For example, if my own beloved brother were to come to me here at this moment and urgently entreat me to give him merely a tenth part of my understanding, and if I myself wished with my whole being to do so, yet I could not, in spite of my most ardent desire, give him even the thousandth part of this understanding, as he has neither the knowledge nor the experience which I have quite accidentally acquired and lived through in my life. No, Professor, it is a hundred times easier, as it is said in the Gospels, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for anyone to give to another the understanding formed in him about anything whatsoever. I formerly also thought as you do, and even chose the activity of a missionary in order to teach everyone faith in Christ. I wanted to make everyone as happy as I myself felt from faith in the teachings of Jesus Christ. But to wish to do that by, so to say, grafting faith on by words, is just like wishing to fill someone with bread merely by looking at him. Understanding is acquired as I have already said, from the totality of information intentionally learned and from personal experiencings, whereas knowledge is only the automatic remembrance of words in a certain sequence. Not only is it impossible, even with all one's desire, to give to another one's own inner understanding, formed in the course of life from the said factors, but also as I recently established with certain other brothers of our monastery, there exists a law that the quality of what is perceived by anyone when another person tells him something, either for his knowledge or his understanding, depends on the quality of the data formed in the person speaking. To help you understand what I've just said, I will cite as an example the fact which aroused in us the desire to make investigations and led us to the discovery of this law. I must tell you that in our brotherhood there are two very old brethren. One is called Brother All and the other Brother Says. These brethren have voluntarily undertaken the obligation of periodically visiting all the monasteries of our order and explaining various aspects of the essence of divinity. Our brotherhood has four monasteries, one of them ours, the second in the valley of the Pamir, the third in Tibet, and the fourth in India. And so these brethren, all and says, constantly travel from one monastery to another and preach there. They come to us once or twice a year, their arrival at our monastery is considered among us a very great event. On the days when either of them is here, the soul of every one of us experiences pure heavenly pleasure and tenderness. The sermons of these two brothers, who are, 
to an almost equal degree holy men, and who speak the same truths, have nevertheless a different effect on all our brethren and on me in particular. When Brother Says speaks, it is indeed like the song of the birds in paradise. From what he says, one is quite, so to say, turned inside out. One becomes as though entranced. His speech pearls like a stream, and one no longer wishes anything else in life but to listen to the voice of Brother Says. But Brother All's speech has almost the opposite effect. He speaks badly and indistinctly, evidently because of his age. No one knows how old he is. Brother says is also very old. It is said three hundred years old. But he is still a hale old man. Whereas Brother All, the weakness of old age is clearly evident. The stronger the impression made at the moment by the words of Brother Says, the more this impression evaporates until there ultimately remains in the hearer nothing at all. But in the case of Brother All, although at first what he says makes almost no impression, later the gist of it takes on a definite form, more and more each day, and is instilled as a whole into the heart and remains there forever. When we became aware of this and began trying to discover why it was so, we came to the unanimous conclusion that the sermons of Brother Says proceeded only from his mind, and therefore acted on our minds, whereas those of Brother All proceeded from his being and acted on our being. Yes, Professor, knowledge and understanding are quite different. Only understanding can lead to being, whereas knowledge is but a passing presence in it. New knowledge displaces the old, and the result is, as it were, a pouring from the empty into the void. One must strive to understand. This alone can lead to our Lord God. And in order to be able to understand the phenomena of nature, according and not according to law, proceeding around us, one must first of all consciously perceive and assimilate a mass of information concerning objective truth and the real events which took place on earth in the past. And secondly, one must bear in oneself all the results of all kinds of voluntary and involuntary experiencings. We had many other similar, never-to-be-forgotten talks with Father Giovanni. Many extraordinary questions which never enter the heads of contemporary people were then aroused in us and elucidated by this rare man, Father Giovanni, the like of whom is scarcely ever met with in contemporary life. One of his explanations, which followed a question put to him by Professor Skridloff two days before we left the monastery, is of enormous interest for everyone, owing to the depth of the thoughts it contained and its possible significance for contemporary people who have already reached responsible age. This question of Professor Skridloff was torn from him as from the depths of his being. When Father Giovanni had said that, before counting on really coming under the effects and influences of the higher forces, it was absolutely necessary to have a soul, which it was possible to acquire only through voluntary and involuntary experiencings and information intentionally learned about real events which had taken place in the past. He convincingly added that this, in its turn, was possible almost exclusively in youth, when the definite data received from great nature are not yet spent on unnecessary fantastic aims, which appear to be good owing only to the abnormally established conditions of the life of people. At these words, Professor Skridloff sighed deeply and exclaimed in despair, 
what then can we do? How can we live on? In answer to this exclamation of Skridloff, Father Giovanni, having remained silent for a moment, expressed those remarkable thoughts which I consider it necessary to reproduce, in so far as possible, word for word. I shall place them as relating to the question of the soul, that is, the third independently formed part of the common presence of a man, in the chapter entitled The Divine Body of Man and Its Needs and Possible Manifestations According to Law, but only in the third series of my writings as complementary to two chapters of the same series, which I have already decided and promised to devote, one to the words of the venerable Persian dervish concerning the body, that is, the first independently formed part in the common presence of a man, and the other to the elucidations of the old Ez Ezunavoran concerning the second independently formed part of a man, namely his spirit. During our stay in this monastery, besides the talks with Father Giovanni, we had frequent conversations with other adepts of the Brotherhood with whom we had also become friends. Having had made their acquaintance through Father Giovanni, who had taken us under his paternal protection. We lived in this monastery about six months, and left it not because we could not have stayed there longer, or did not wish to, but only because we were finally so overfilled with the totality of impressions we had received that it seemed as if even a little more would make us lose our minds. Our stay there brought us so many answers to the psychological and archaeological questions which interested us that it then seemed as if we had nothing more to seek, at least for a long time. So we abandoned our journey and returned to Russia by almost the same way as we had come. After arriving in Tiflis, the professor and I parted, he going to Piatigorsk by the Georgian military road to see his elder daughter, and I to Alexandropol to my family. After this I did not see Professor Skridloff for rather a long time, but we corresponded regularly. I saw him for the last time in the second year of the World War in Piatigorsk, where he was visiting his daughter. I shall never forget the last conversation I had with him on the summit of Mount Becho. At that time, I was living in Esentuki, and one day, when we met in Kislovotsk, he proposed that, in remembrance of the good old days, we should climb Mount Becho, which was not far from Piatigorsk. One fine morning, about two weeks after this meeting, taking provisions with us, we did indeed set out on foot from Piatigorsk toward this mountain and began the ascent up the rocks from the difficult side, that is, the side at the foot of which there is a well-known monastery. This ascent is considered very difficult by everybody who has made it, and it was indeed not easy. Yet for both of us, after the mountains we had climbed up and down during our many travels together through the wilds of Central Asia, it was, as is said, child's play. Nevertheless, we experienced great pleasure from this ascent and felt ourselves, after the monotonous life of the city, in an element which had already become almost natural to us. Although it is not high, this mountain is so situated in relation to the surrounding countryside that from its summit we saw spread out before our eyes an extensive panorama of really extraordinary beauty. Far to the south arose the majestic snow-capped peaks of Elbrus, with the great chain of the Caucasian mountains outlined on both sides of it. Below us, as in miniature, could be seen the numerous settlements, towns, and villages of almost the entire region of the mineral waters, and just below to the north stood out various parts of the town of Zeleznovotsk, Silence reigned all round. 
No one was on the mountain, and no one was likely to come, as the usual easy road leading up from the northern side was visible for many miles, and as clear as the palm of one's hand, and there was no one to be seen on it. And as for the southern face by which we had come, one rarely meets anybody daring enough to climb that. On the summit of the mountain was a small hut, evidently for the sale of beer and tea, but that day there was no one there. We sat down on a rock and began to eat, each of us spellbound by the grandeur of the scenery, silently thought his own thoughts. Suddenly my glance rested on the face of Professor Skridloff, and I saw that tears were streaming from his eyes. "'What's the matter, old fellow?' I asked him. "'Nothing,' he answered, drying his eyes, and then added, "'In general, during the last two or three years, "'my inability to control the automatic manifestations of my subconsciousness "'and my instinct is such that I have become almost like an hysterical woman. "'What has just happened has happened to me many times during this period.' It is very difficult to explain what takes place in me when I see or hear anything majestic, which allows no doubt that it proceeds from the actualization of our Maker-Creator. Each time my tears flow of themselves. I weep, that is to say, it weeps in me. Not from grief, no, but as if from tenderness. I became so gradually after meeting Father Giovanni, whom you remember we met together in Kafiristan, to my worldly misfortune. After that meeting, my whole inner and outer world became for me quite different. In the definite views which had become rooted in me in the course of my whole life, there took place, as it were, by itself, a revaluation of all values. Before that meeting I was a man wholly engrossed in my own personal interests and pleasures, and also in the interests and pleasures of my children. I was always occupied with thoughts of how best to satisfy my needs and the needs of my children. Formerly, it may be said, my whole being was possessed by egoism. All my manifestations and experiencings flowed from my vanity. The meeting with Father Giovanni killed all this, and from then on there gradually arose in me that something which has brought the whole of me to the unshakable conviction that, apart from the vanities of life, there exists a something else, which must be the aim and ideal of every more or less thinking man, and that it is only this something else which may make a man really happy and give him real values, instead of the illusory goods with which in ordinary life he is always and in everything full.'